Hi everyone, this is Neil Wright here, consultant, audiologist and director of Clearwax. Thank you for joining me in my latest video using the iClearscope Endoscope. And this is of a patient who recently visited, well I can say recently, um, probably the day before they visited myself, booked in with a local pharmacist for earwax removal. Now I don't know whether they saw the pharmacist or the sales assistant. Um, as if you've been following my channel for the last few years, you probably aware that in the UK earwax removal is not regulated and there's a lot of both non-suitably qualified healthcare professionals but also non-clinical people getting trained to remove earwax which is a bit scary um, and so this patient was advised that they had a bit of wax which the person they saw removed and then they um, were told that they've got an ear infection now that must mean by default they saw a pharmacist because the person then prescribes some topical antibiotics. Now, this patient wasn't entirely convinced, so they booked him with myself. And as you can see, they don't have a bacterial infection. It's a fungal infection. It's called otomycosis. And more specifically, it is a strain of fungus called aspilogis. And more specifically than that, I think they've got... Um, Flavus aspilogis. So hopefully, I've pronounced that correctly. So you can get um, aspilogis niger, for example, which typically you get black fungal spores. They can st start off being this greeny color, but the flavus aspilogis strain is known to be this color, and they've got loads of hyphae, so this woolly strands. Now, if they used the topical antibiotics, it would have actually made this fungal infection, so otomycosis, far worse. And so not only was the patient experiencing itchiness, but they they were experiencing a blocked ear. Now you might think, why are they experiencing a blocked ear? Because the ear canal itself is quite patent. It's, uh, it's not occluded, but you'll see they've got a thick layer of skin lining the eardrum. As soon as I removed that, they were hearing a lot better now. This skin is quite a thick, dry blanket. It's really a did. <coughs> you can see how I'm using the suction probe, not only to kind of use the suction power to lift it, but also um, I'm just using it like a correct. I'm kind of gliding it, trying to lift it. And I am going to use both the forceps in a moment and the correct. The slight issue that I had initially with this patient, um, you probably see it here, they were clenching their jaw quite a lot. And when you clench their jaw, and it was kind of intermittent, it wasn't that they just clenched the jaw and kept it in a fixed position. They were opening and closing their jaw. They were a bit nervous, so that's the reason why. And it was causing the ear to go up and down, up and down. And then at this stage, it wasn't causing me too much of an issue. Um, but later, it slightly did. So um, the patient was able to... And uh, I think they were more relaxed at that point anyway, because they, they weren't experiencing any discomfort. And it, it's, they managed to keep their jaw still. So I used the forceps to good effect. And I'm going to use the forceps on a couple of more occasions. So you can see, now you can see this thick um, blanket of skin. You can see those fungal spores moving around, hovering um, due to the suction. It does get the hairs at the back of my neck standing up when I see that, actually. And I'm trying to avoid any drops if possible. I think I do use some right at the end. Um, and the skin is peeling away nicely, but I am going to have to use the forceps. But when we're quite deep in the air... Um, this bit's probably okay, but there's a bit to the left, right near the anterior canal wall, where I had to use the forceps, and it was really tricky because there's hardly any space there, and I didn't want to bump into the front part of the ear canal using the side jaw. That bit just separated, but I managed to get the bulk of this out, I think, of the eardrum on this visit, I think. So as I'm peeling, I'm going to the left and then up. This is the bit I'm going up. And I managed to clear that off the eardrum. This is, the eardrum is probably about 0.1 or 0.2 millimetres in diameter. But that blanket of dry skin is probably the same thickness, which basically meant the eardrum is double in terms of its thickness. And obviously, it's going to vibrate less. So although the eardrum is clear, they've still got all this <coughs> um, dead skin and... Um, fungal spores so and it's all lining the ear canal so it's really tricky to remove but the suction was a bit tricky so I'm just using the right 
angle correct and I've designed this in such a way where the tip is tapered so it's a lot thinner and you can use it like a wallpaper scraper yeah, I was trying to think of a better analogy but you still got to be very very gentle because we're on the bony part of the ear canal here so I did pre-warn the patient um, uh, they were fine though there was no discomfort so as I'm gliding I'm gliding with the contour the curvature of the ear to reduce any friction and the tip really, really is so useful with the, the right correct. It just elevates it. So now that I've lifted it enough, I'm just going back in with the suction tip, trying to peel this up and away. And we do manage to get the majority of the dead skin and fungal spores out. And obviously, uh, contacted the doctors to get um, some antifungal drops, told them not to use the antibiotics because again, that would have just made it worse. And um, the, the patient, I, I did ask why, why did you, it was just, I wanted to understand the psyche. Why did you um, see a pharmacist for your ears and not an audiologist or you know, an ENT or a doctor or an, EN, uh, an, uh, an ear nurse? And his response was, well, they were advertising earwax removal. So uh, I assumed that you know, they've got the same level of knowledge as yourself. Um, and and I can under, kind of understand that because if you are a member of the public, I mean, I'll probably be the same. Why would they advertise this service if they're not appropriately qualified? Now, the tr some of the training courses in the UK are extremely poor and they, they will just pass you even if you're not competent because obviously for them it's serving their own purpose. They can sell the equipment and you know, they sell consumables. Um, so the lack of regulation here is extremely poor um, so yeah um, it was interesting and I don't have to explain you know the years of experience I've had about four year of, um, undergraduate degree um, you know I did a first year of my PhD as well uh, working you know, this is what I do day to day and in fact all I do is well although I do now and again do some hearing aids but um, I've dedicated my whole last 10 years of my career to, to this, which is um, ear care. So, you know, for uh, someone to go on a one or two day course. Now, I think the training for pharmacists moving forward, if I'm not correct, I'm not mistaken as their undergraduate degree, where they do, they, so at the moment, if you're a pharmacist, um, you can't prescribe unless you take, uh, another course, although that has changed a bit with the pharmacy first scheme, but typically um, you would have to. But I think the pharmacy first scheme it's particular conditions. But um, if you're prescribing pharmacies, you you've got a bit more scope, if I'm not mistaken, and there is some training there for ears. Now um, we have trained prescribing because you know, when I first realised that you know pharmacists can prescribe medication for ear infections, I thought well the, the training must have been really in depth, and. Although for some it is, because I have trained a couple many years ago, um, and they had exceptional knowledge of the year. You can see that they had some really high level training. But at the same time, I've had some other prescribing pharmacist, um, one's a friend as well, and they're allowed to prescribe for the ear, but they have openly admitted that they, they don't feel comfortable, their training is really poor, and so they don't. So since then, I've stopped training pres even prescribing pharmacists because I just don't know the level of training, I would have thought it's standardised. I'm not sure if it is. Um, some prescribing pharmacists advise that it is, others say no. It might just be the individual. Um, but I can't imagine an audiologist misdiagnosing this for... Well, there, there must be. I'm, I'm probably being... I think in any profession, there's going to be mistakes being made, but the, the likelihood is going to be far, far, far less... Um, almost zero, but I can never say zero, that a qualified audiologist would misdiagnose that for a bacterial infection instead of a fungal. Now, sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate, particularly if it's candida, because that can discre uh, excrete a thick, creamy discharge. And sometimes with the bacterial infections, you also get a similar uh, colour of discharge. Sometimes you get more of a greeny discharge. But... Um, it's sometimes difficult and you know those cases an ear swab is taken by the GP surgery but this was such a clear-cut case so 
yeah um, anyway so I used to correct quite well there there's still some skin here the more I get out for the patient the better it's going to be um, so I was always checking in on his comfort and he was fine there was no problem whatsoever again just using the correct on the back wall it's not something you know I would initially reach out for the correct to scrape this because it is sensitive um, and I will try and use the, the suction tip first if I can peel it but this is just too adhesive it's too thin uh, so with the correct at least I could lift and once I've lifted it a little bit I can then go back to the, the suction so with the suction once you've lifted it you're not going to make quite well you're less likely to make contact with the canal wall and make it uncomfortable for the patient with the correct you are literally having to go on the canal wall so there's a bit here as well so here the skin does come away I think without using the correct and I'm just flicking so as I'm there, but do I use the correct? Let's have a look. No, I'm going back into the search and so I've just probably got a slightly larger 16 gauge and I'm, there was enough there to tag onto, to lift away. And once I've lifted it, I've got better ability to peel again. It's a bit hanging out. And I'm so close to the canal wall. Of course, what you're seeing on the screen is really magnified now in the real ears. It's such a minute space. Now, this is the frustrating bit because you've got this very thin layer of skin here with fungal spores and it's, it's in the, the, the height of the inferior recess. It's such a difficult region to peel. And this is where I just use a bit of drops, just a little bit, just, just, just to soften this bit. And it did come away nicely. But I'm just trying to see if it comes away just completely dry. Yeah, I'm too close to the eardrum here. Like, so I'm having to lift the skin, and as I'm lifting, I'm going up and away, and it's going towards the eardrum. And the ear canal, it, it sinks in there as a trench. So getting the suction tip into that cavity and peeling it away, so it's just, it's going to be, yeah, uh, it's best just I use a bit, just a bit of oil. Now, I read some um, research papers uh, about a year, 18 months ago, that it's an Indian research paper where they found that there's a high percentage of people in India, obviously they use um, non-medical grade coconut and uh, mustard oil in the ear. And it's found that fungi can feed off that. Now with olive oil, it's a bit different. There's not, again, I'm doing some more research at the moment, but um, it's not quite the same. So fungi are, uh, don't feed off olive oil in the same way as uh, mustard oil or coconut oil but there's limited research um but again this is medical grade olive oil so i just put enough and obviously i'm cleaning it out and this patient's immediately going to use antifungals so but there's no other way of retrieving that and even with the drops it's still tricky so you can see all the the ring of blood capillaries um surrounding the eardrum going radially inwards that's the normal orientation of these particular ones um, and they're a bit dilated because we did peel that their skin it's a bit dull there as well but um i bet sometimes you know, you know it can be a bit dull you know you've got a thick layer of skin like that for a while and and sometimes when I say dull, there's no light reflex. Now, normally when you look inside an ear, um, you, in the left ear, you see a light reflection around seven o'clock and in the right ear, it's about, let's say, four or five o'clock. Um, and that's because at that point in the eardrum, it kind of, it dimples inwards, it recesses, and it's a flat part of the eardrum. The eardrum is not sitting directly flat towards the entrance. There's an oblique angle. The top right is closer to the entrance in the bottom left in the left ear and vice versa for the right. But at seven o'clock, the way, because the, the hammer bone, the, the middle bone, the umbo, the bit in the middle, because that's attached to the eardrum, it pulls that part of the eardrum in and just to the left of it, the eardrum's kind of more of a flatter surface. So that part of the eardrum is reflecting and facing directly back at the entrance. So when you examine the ear and you've got a light source, the light reflects that part of the eardrum. And so whenever you've got an absent light reflex, you can always possibly think there's a problem with the middle ear, but not always. And sometimes you can get a light reflex and they have got a problem in the middle ear. 
So I'm really happy with that. I'll drop there right here as well. Take care, bye.